All right, someone asked a question on Twitter a couple, uh, at this point, maybe a week or two ago. Is atheism the default position? And I answered that tweet, and I said, I don't see how it could be, probably not. Now, regardless of whether God exists or does not exist, one thing we know for a fact, if you look at the history of the world, this is inarguably true, the ascribing of agency is as common as grass. Atheism, to somewhat, to believe that there are no supernatural beings or no supernatural entities to draw upon is still in this today, our modern also scientific world, not relatively rare. If you're talking historically speaking, all but non-existent. In today's world, yeah, there are a bunch of atheists, but even the nons are not necessarily atheists. Like I said, the ascribing of agency is as common as grass. It is, it is basically, it seems to be innate to human beings and primal and innate. That doesn't mean that God exists. It just means that people naturally tend to perceive beings and supernatural beings. If you, if you, uh, you know, supernatural beings and gods and things like that. If you, if you re include all of recorded history, it's a hundred times more, it is a um, hundred times more common than, than atheism. I mean, people aren't going to like this if this is true. Theism is therefore the more plausible alternative. Your head will explode, but that's a basic fact. Why? Entailed in the concept of plausibility, entailed in the concept of plausibility is how easy is it for people to believe. If you have a, even Christianity, which is asking you to believe kind of a lot right from the jump, you know, unless you want to be like a totally watered down Christian, which you can be, but... It's asking you to believe at least two miracles, a resurrection and an immaculate conception. Okay, that's kind of a tall order. But even with those two caveats, those two hard-to-believe, implausible things right at the beginning, there's still a billion Christians worldwide. That's a lot more than atheists, which means it is by definition the more plausible alternative than gods or godlike entities do not exist. That's why so few atheists are willing to publicly defend that. As I said, God does not exist. Why? Because it's not that plausible. Entailed in the concept of plausibility is how easy for people to believe. Now, let's say for argument's sake that you've listened to my videos and you're still an atheist. <laughs> you know, could, could be. You haven't been convinced yet. All right, fair enough. So let's say God does not exist. How do we account for the fact that the ascribing of agency is as common as grass? And that's a fact. Even atheists themselves catch themselves doing it. They've got to do some work to not do it. I've heard them talk about it. They've said stuff like, oh, my Christian brainwashing is so complete. <laughs> my, I swear to God, I heard this with my own, I saw this. My Christian brainwashing, I don't even remember who's doing it. Christian brainwashing is so complete that I still sometimes wake up and think, God put it on my heart to do X. Ascribing of agencies is common as grass. You have to work. You have to do some work to not perceive it. Seems to be an embedded psychological reality in the makeup of human beings. And... If God does not exist, how do we account for it? Well, I can do it pretty easily. Yeah, I actually can. Um, I can prove that there are... I can basically prove that there are, to some degree, invisible entities that we are interacting with all the time. Prove it. Literally prove it. Literally prove Prove it, Craig! I'm going to! <laughs> yeah, literally prove it. Um, so, Jesus said, for example... When two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Well, interesting fact about that. That is true of every ideology under the sun. When two or three or four are gathered in the name of any ideology, any core beliefs, that's a psychological reality, which we all know exists, okay, that ideology is now present with them. When an ideology is present, it's a psychological paradigm, basic psychological paradigm. You've got five people who believe in ideology X. There it is with them, present with them. Now that... That psychological reality, which may be purely psychological, once it is adopted as an ideology believed collectively, collectively, it has a life of its own. It has, for all intents and purposes, an ontology. I promise that's true and provably true. It has a life of its own. This is why when the Apostle Paul talks about powers and principalities, doesn't mean these are demonic entities that are conscious. It means they have an ontology and a life of their own. So if 50 people believe in ideology X, it's very similar to what, uh, who was the guy who talked about religion as a mind virus? 
uh, Dawkins? I forget who, who originally called it. That's kind of true. It's not true in Christianity. Either. It's not true in Christianity. It's kind of true, though. All ideologies and beliefs that are believed collectively function to a degree like a virus. Okay, interesting thing about a virus. It has an ontology. It's not quite alive. It's not quite conscious. But it has a life of its own. And it operates according to its own, you know, behavioral mechanism, one's form. Ideology lives the exact same way. And I can literally prove that. So it's really easy for people to believe in supernatural beings and entities. Why? Because they are responding to things that are actually somewhat present. Are they devils and demons? You know, I don't know. They're not necessarily conscious. That's going a step too far. That would be, you know, I'd probably not. Okay? But they are literally, when Paul talks about powers and principalities, there are literal psychological paradigms once adopted by people en masse collectively. It has a life of its own, and it becomes a power and principality. I can literally prove this. You ever been in a, in a situation where, where there was a whole crowd of people getting really, really, really angry, and the, the mob was getting all riled up? The atmosphere changes. The entire atmosphere changes. That's not just a, a cool metaphor that people use in, like, writing books. The atmosphere was charged with anger and hatred. That's literally true. That's not just metaphor. It's literally true. The atmosphere itself changes in response to psych collective psychological engagement that has an actual ontology. That's why it's so easy for people to believe in supernatural beings and supernatural whatevers. Why? Because they are responding to things that are literally present. If you've ever been in an angry mob, you can feel a palpable presence of, you know, anger. So for a Christian to say that's a demon of anger is only just adding consciousness to it. It's literally there, it's literally present, it's literally in the atmosphere, it's literally a presence. Does it have consciousness? Probably not. But it functions the same way a virus does. So, like, let's say you're trying to stop touching wiener. <laughs> you, became a Christian, you became a Christian because you listened to Craig Reed videos, and you decided Craig Reed is telling a lot of things Craig says make complete sense. Wow, is that guy out nailing it. Okay, everything I just said makes complete sense, and it's perfectly consistent with every scientific and psychological book you have ever read, I promise. Provable facts, I just told you, I swear to God. Okay, so let's say you are you 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 now you're now starting to believe in God because you've been listening to Craig Reed videos and you wanna stop touching your wiener all the time because you're pretty sure God's gonna send you to hell, you know, and stop. So you go and you, you try and quit doing pornography. Okay. You, you can be addicted to pornography just like anything else. So let's say you're trying to cure that addiction. You walk past a strip club. The entire atmosphere of the strip club is, is charged up with a spirit of lust. Is it literally a demonic presence that has consciousness and agency? No, probably not. But everyone in that strip club, to one degree or another, is being dominated by the same emotional, physical, physiological experience. It is a power and a principality. If you walk past that, when you're trying to quit that thing, you'll get sucked in. They know this in, in recovery rooms. They talk about stuff in recovery rooms where they tell you to be spiritual. They mean something really ecumenical and easy to lay hold of. That's how I know God models can be watered down to the point where they are eminently reasonable, eminently plausible. As I've said, the Schopenhauer God, the sum total of all physical laws and natural laws. We all know that exists. That's not God, Craig. It's pretty darn close. Any God model can be watered down to the point where it's easy to believe in. Literally simple. Literally easy to believe in just like that. Turn it on just like that. Well, you don't have to believe in every single aspect of Christianity to understand the basic God exists, you know, with some sort of indefinable thing. Well, whatever, I won't go into it. Every God idea can be watered down to the point where it's eminently plausible. So when I was in AA, they tell you, to, you know, you can have a higher power and your higher power can be anything. Can be that doorknob. Okay, one of the things that AA is really particularly good at is talking almost completely in metaphors. Metaphors make hard concepts to understand easy to understand. So they'll say stuff like they use the disease concept for alcoholism. It's not. I'm pretty sure alcoholism doesn't technically qualify as disease. It's just a metaphor that makes it easier for you to beat it. 
if you think of it as a disease, because it does have a kind of ontology as if it were a disease. I'm not exactly sure what the specific criteria that makes something a disease, but I don't think it quite qualifies, but I don't remember. I don't, that's not relevant. What is relevant is that they talk almost completely in metaphor. So you're in the room and they'll say stuff like, my disease is doing push-ups outside. And everybody in the room knows exactly what, you what they're talking about. While we're sitting here talking about alcohol, you know, this thing, this disease of alcohol, this, this thing that's been destroying our lives is getting stronger. And to some degree, it's like cunning and it's thinking about ways to beat us. So it's not quite a conscious, but you literally experience it as if it's conscious. As if it's some sort of demonic presence in your life literally trying to destroy you. That's why people say, like, you know, his demons got the worst of him. Do they literally mean demons? No, not really, but kind of, sort of. There's a fine line here, because these physiological responses and physiological entities, once believed en masse or agreed to communally, have ontology. That's my point, and provably so. So let's go to the example of Nazi Germany. So you get it, right? When they say my disease is doing push-ups outside, the alcoholism is getting stronger, you know, and then they tell you don't go back to, to people, places, and things. Why? The mental associations are so powerful that you go back to like, you know, they say don't go back to the old neighborhood. Why? Because you're going to have, you, 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 those old associations are going to trigger something in your brain and then you're going to want to drink again. And that's a real psychological phenomenon. I can promise you I'm paying death. I went through it 150,000 times. And then they talk almost only all in metaphor. Why? It's easier to understand and make sense of some of these ethereal concepts when you talk in metaphor. So Paul talks about powers and principalities. It's kind of a metaphor, but it's also provably true. So let's take it back to not... This is why it's so easy for people to believe in God, God-like beings and God entities. Why? Because there are psychological presences of things that are actually provably there. Promise. Just as I said with like... Go, go, go watch a bar fight. Anger will be charged in the atmosphere. It will be a presence in the room. Does that mean it's a demonic presence with consciousness? Probably not. But you can actually tangibly experience a change in atmosphere. I swear to God that's true. It's what, bread and butter of what I'm going to start to talk about with my religious experiences. Because it's the same principle at work. Uh, but we haven't got there yet. So let's take something like Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany was an ideology. If you were in Nazi Germany, everything was Nazified to one degree or another, and every person was under that power and principality to one degree or another. Why? Because the, the society collectively assented to it, giving it psychological reality and a life of its own, and then an actual ontology. You would see the difference if your own eyes, really obviously, if you were in Nazi Germany and you crossed the border into Switzerland. <laughs> be a lot more peaceful and say, wait a minute, we're all the Nazi flags and the guys who hate everyone Jews, so they're not here. Why? Because the ontology didn't cross this border. That's what they mean in the Bible when they say demons are territorial. To some degree, these psychological entities, I, I'm not sure that they're demons, I'm not calling them that, but they're, they are actual entities. This is basics of Jungian metaphysics, you know, this is basically provable fact. It's provable fact that you're in Nazi Germany and it's dominated by Nazism and then you walk to Switzerland and there's an entirely different reality, entirely different ontology. The entire society, culture, atmosphere, everything is different. Even the air you breathe would be different. Why? It's not charged up with Nazism. The ontology isn't present. You see the difference? That's provable fact, guys. That's provable fact, guys. Which brings us to the religious experience. Now, I have said, I go back in my prayer closet, and almost everybody believes the first part. And I have a subjective, internal experience, 100% real to me, that I honestly believe is God. Everybody believes that. But it's not God, Greg, we understand, okay. <laughs> we got you, it's not God. It's all in your head. doesn't really matter if it's all in my pretty little head. Why? Because to some degree, to some degree, psychological realities have their own ontology too. By believing something to some degree, you actually... It's not to the degree that a Wu artist would have you believe, but to some degree, like I, I've tried to explain with peace of mind, to some degree me, me believing I have peace of mind is actually creating peace of mind. And more importantly, because when I go to church and now we ascend to the same sort of transcendent other ideals collectively, and I tell you that there is a presence in the room with us, the worship music starts and then what a Christian will des describe as the anointing descends. This is basically observable phenomena. 
What does that mean? Is empir available for empirical investigation is more or less provable fact. And as soon as scientists get around to studying it, they will back up everything I just told you. For example, um, why aren't scientists studying it now? Because, you know, scientists are all, you know, well, let's go to church and study those guys. No, those are dumb guys who do the dumb things. Oh, okay, look, not bother. It's observable phenomena, though. Check it out. Is the wind blowing? Look out your window right now. Is the wind blowing? You know. How do you know? Look at the leaves. How do you know? Look at the leaves. The leaves are moving. You can't see the wind, but you can see the secondary phenomena of the wind affecting the leaves. Church operates the same way. Observable phenomena. Is the wind blowing? You, you can observe the phenomena of the wind on the leaves. As if the leaves are moving, the wind is blowing. Observable phenomena. Church operates the same way. When I go to my church, we meet collectively. We have, to some degree, shared values, shared beliefs. When we all get together with those shared values and shared beliefs, there's to some degree a form of entanglement there. We have read some of the same stuff. We have agreed to some of the same things. Jesus said, when two or more gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. There I am in the midst of them. To some degree, that is tangibly and palpably and provably true. To some degree. To some degree. Now there is a hundred people gathered in the name of this ideology or this core system of values or beliefs that we call Christianity. Then the music starts. They all collectively, in unison, automatically start doing worship together. It is observable phenomena. If you've ever seen Christians worshiping in the type of church I'm talking about, all the hands get raised, everyone starts going, singing praises, observable phenomena, which means it is available for empirical investigation. Once something is available for empirical investigation, like the wind that is blowing on the leaves, and that's how we know it's there, there is a tangible presence in that room. Tangible, just like with the with the spirit of anger, when the, when the crowd is all riled up, the spirit of love and Jesus and compassion in the room is tangible presence. When I turn on worship music and I tell you that within five to ten minutes I am experiencing what I call the peace of God which passeth all, passeth all understanding, I am telling you a fact. I am telling you a fact. I am legitimately having experience that I am describing as the peace of God. You say, it's probably not God. It doesn't necessarily matter. Doesn't. Why? Because collectively when you agree to this... It's hard to explain. <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to get hard to explain. Um, 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 uh, maybe, I'll, maybe, maybe I'll stop now. I don't, know. I, don't know. I don't feel like I don't feel like going further with it just yet. <laughs> um... They, one day, scientists, right now scientists aren't going to the church where I attend, and they aren't investigating. One day there will be a clear set of diagnostic criteria for a Holy Spirit encounter experience. That's a fact. Why, it's an actual experience that's part of the real world. Something I experience every single solitary day of my life. You, you, when we're talking about choices and, and decision makings, I could give each and every person listening to me a series of exercises over a series of months. And I've said this before in the past, and one guy almost took me up on it and then <laughs> sort of stopped doing it. But I could give you a series of exercises and a series of ways of looking at the world wherein I could pretty much almost guarantee you, almost guarantee you, in order to not ascribe agency, you are doing some work. It's not quite what Romans 1.20 presents, but it's pretty darn close. Even atheists ascribe agency almost automatically and innate. Someone's like, well, I don't see how describing of agency is God belief. I, okay, don't, don't, don't burn. I guess you don't understand what the ascribing of agency means. It's like, okay, what do you think it means? And he starts going, well, why don't you tell me what you think it means? Because, okay, let's waste seven more hours of my time. No, thank you. <laughs> ascribing of agency means you are perceiving... Now, this could be solely a physiological thing. That's why I don't like talking some of these ways. I'm trying to be even careful. Because this could totally be just a total psychological response. But that doesn't matter. Why? Because even collective psychology produces ontology. Ontology. Something happened in Nazi Germany. That's a verifiable fact. Collective psychology produced ideology. Ideologies believed in produce a life of their own. This is a fact. This is a provable fact. 
So when the Christians all believed together, I could, I could actually literally teach you to amplify your emotional responses, whatever is inside of me that's really good at perceiving this and really good at interacting with this and was kind of good right from the start. There's certain ways that I'm wired that I've just noticed about myself is really different from how most atheists are. Okay, they tend to be, you know, analytic, logical, analytic, logical, and they overemphasize the value of logical thinking. It's worthwhile up to a point, and then it's useless. And they overemphasize the value of it. I've been the exact opposite through most of my life. I was mostly intuitive and emotional. I learned to trust my intuitions and my perceptions. Why? Because they saved my life many times. <laughs> and I really, really, really learned to count on them and trust them. Why? Because I could tell that they were accurate. I sat down with you for an hour or two, I generally speaking would start to pick up on things about you that you don't even know about yourself. Many of the time people said I know them better than they know themselves. For that maybe 500 times my time, maybe a thousand times my life. I hear that a, heard that a lot. It's because I'm good at picking up details and reading, reading the room as it were, it's called. Perceiving things, perceiving things in the atmosphere. Those things in the atmosphere that are being perceived, I'm not quite saying they're conscious agents or demons, but they are tangible realities. Tangible presences and tangible realities. To, me, to make them sort of exactly as, this, as, as a, a Christian, some certain type, some Christians don't believe in this type of stuff, but to make it as a certain type of Christian would describe it, it'd have to be a conscious thing. I don't quite think it's that, or at least there's no, let's just, let's just talk atheist for a second, there's no evidence that it's conscious. But there's tons of evidence that it's there, and when psychological realities are assented to by a group of people, there's an ontology to it. Mind virus is, is, a, is a correct term. It's what actually happens. There's an, ont there's an ontology to a virus. That's why it's so hard to defeat, right? And it latches onto the host, and ideologies act the, almost the exact same way. There's an ontology to them. That's not actually a life, which is what a demonic presence would be. It's not necessarily conscious, but... It's perceivable, and that's why people, that's why it's a hundred times more plausible for people to believe in God and God-like entities. Why? Because they're, those, those realities are there. They're present. They're tangible. They're, they're, they're perceivable. You have to do some work to tune them out. Or to, you know, go, I perceive them, but that, that's definitely not God. It's definitely not anything like God-like being at all. I perceive it, but it's definitely... That's what Rad, when Irrationality Rules was making his, his honest video, he started talking about he saw his subconscious mind saw a car up in the road ahead and warned him, you know, slow down or something like that. That's a, that's a common experience to human beings. That's not necessarily God telling you, hey, slow down, stupid, you're going to get yourself killed. It's not necessarily that, but it's third-party agency. That's what it is experienced as. It, ultimately, it may have a lot to do, and I, this is why I think there's, there's going to be provable facts here, because I think it has a lot to do with, you know, some of, some of the stuff I'm starting to talk about with, with quantum mechanics. There's a lot of stuff here that is provable fact. Provable fact. And it isn't quite religious the way uh, religious people talk about it, but it's in essence the same thing. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's essentially... It's the same idea. So when Paul talks about powers and principalities, he's talking about something that is tangible and real. It's maybe only a psychological reality, but like I said, psychological realities agreed to collectively formulate ontologies. They have a life of their own. So it might not be a conscious agent, but you can understand easily why people think it is. Why? Because for all intents and purposes it is, it acts like one has an ontology and a life of its own. See what I'm saying? No. Okay. Well, all right. All right. Wait, wait till the next video. No, really don't. Okay. Well, fair enough. <laughs> no, don't get it up. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, you'll get there. You'll get there. I, I promise you I'm on the doorstep of being able to prove a lot of stuff. Why? Because it's not that complicated, guys. It's not that complicated. You have to do some work to not ascribe agencies. You have to actually perceive things that you literally perceived and then tell yourself, well, it wasn't what I thought it was. You have to do some work to shut down that mechanism. It seems to be innate. It seems to be primal and it seems to be innate. doesn't mean God exists. I'm not saying that that means God exists. I mean, that's exactly why people are so readily, easily, you know, falling into to 
belief systems, even nons, guys. Go talk to nons. I swear to God, go talk to them. As far as they're concerned, God is omnipresent, or God-like entities, or supernatural. They're omnipresent. Go talk to them. So, I think that all made sense. If not, you know, I'll clean it up. I'll clean it up a little and present it even better. <laughs> even better next I'll try better next time. Okay? How's that sound? That sounds good. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I think, that, I think that all made sense. I'll go over it again. This is, this is just a beginning. This is just the beginning of this, these new pages that I'm on. It's the dawning of a new era. It's the dawning of a new era. It's just the beginning. Um, so, you know, we'll get there. We'll all get there together. It'll be, it'll be beautiful. Pretty soon we'll all be Bigfoot, Bigfoot, Bigfoot devotees. Masses, so, damn kids, masses ended. Go in peace. Amen.